Necronomicon. The Wanderings of El Azred by Donald Tyson, Part 2. The Fourth Portal, Leading to Yuggoth. A strange race known to the herdsmen of Langi and their folktales dwells in a world of ice and darkness beyond the sphere of Saturn, yet within the orbit of the fixed stars. They call it Yuggoth, and it is unknown to our astrologers, for it cannot be seen with the eyes. It is not their world of origin, which lies within the constellation of stars known as A. Dub al Akbar, the Greater Bear, yet it is still so remote from the Earth that our Sun is a mere point of light in the star crusted blackness of their sky, and offers no warmth that can be discerned to their touch. A single great moon circles their heavens, much larger than the moon we know and is in color a dull purple similar to the color of bruised flesh. They dwell in caverns and get their heat from fissures that emit sulfurous plumes of gas. Glowing lichen on the cavern walls offer a faint crimson illumination that is sufficient for their needs, for their eyes are adapted to the murk so that they see as well in the night as we see in the day. It is difficult for the traveler to judge their size, for there are no measures of comparison with the human form and the weight of things on their world is less than the weight we know so that, when dropped, a stone falls slowly as through water. Their bodies are covered in a horny armor or shell that is similar to the armor of scorpions or to sea creatures such as the crab. This natural defense makes them dreadful warriors as neither sword nor axe can penetrate it. Little can be seen of this shell for their entire bodies are furred in a white fungus that resembles bristling hair. Only their faces and their powerful hands, shaped much as are the pincers of a scorpion but having more complex movements that allow them to grasp tools, are bare of this fungoidal fur. They are a race of warriors and farmers. When not making more, all their care is devoted to the cultivation of a single type of fungus resembling that which grows upon their shells. It is their sole source of nourishment, as they are dependent upon it for their survival, so it requires their constant tending to flourish, for it will not grow without their assistance. Indeed, they and the plant they cultivate cannot be said to exist separately, for should either fail, the other would surely perish. It was their constant need to fortify their fungal crop that sent these creatures to our world in search of certain minerals in the ground that are rare on Yuggoth but abundant here. The minerals are applied sparingly to the fungus beds in the same way that our farmers spread rotted manure upon their fields, and for the same purpose. It is said among the inhabitants of Ling that the race first arrived at a time following the great war between the Elder Things and the armies of Cthulhu, after the Old Ones had retreated from the malignant alignment of the stars, and they came not as humble visitors seeking charity but as conquerors, and such is ever their way. There was no subtlety in their mining, they turned the skin of our world inside out, causing great destruction of plants and beasts. The Elder Ones resented their intrusion into our world and fought them with their arts, but were unequal in might to the space spore from Yuggoth, who drove them from all the northern and central regions of our world, forcing them to seek refuge in the deepest parts of the southern ocean. The caverns of Yuggoth are splendorous and vast. Where nature on their world has not sufficed for their purposes, they have carved the rock and have constructed buttresses to reinforce the roofs and great arches to span the crevasses. The floors rise and fall irregularly, but offer no impediment to the progress of the dwellers who leap across minor barriers on their powerful legs. Because the weight of things is less in their world, these leaps carry their bodies farther than the bounds of a mountain ramp. They have no families but live in groups of a score or more and spawn their young from their own bodies in a way that resembles the budding of plants. When the young are mature enough to move about and eat the fungoidal crop, they fall from the backs of the adults like ripe fruit from the tree, already covered in the white fungus that acts as their fur. The creatures worship their moon and seem to have no other religion or god apart from the livid sphere that rises and falls in their dark sky. Its cycles govern the growth of the crop they rely upon for nourishment, and it is also their express belief, when they speak of such matters among themselves, that it generates the heat within the center of their world that causes the sulfurous plumes to issue from their vents, providing warmth for the living things of the caverns. 
It is forbidden to journey to the moon under penalty of death both of the flesh and of the soul. Indeed, violation of this prohibition is their greatest sin and is accorded the most severe punishment in their laws. It is equally a crime to speak about it or even to look upon it when they travel across the upper surface of their world. A soul flyer of our race who journeyed to Yugath once used the power of his will to compel the inhabitants serving as his vessel to go to the surface and gaze up at the moon, for they can be ridden like a horse but do not completely lose their awareness and at times resist instruction. Great was the battle of wills before the monster would lift its eyes, and the sight of the moon filled it with such terror and nausea that it became weak and fell to the earth upon its face. When it recovered its strength, it drew forth a blade and, by inserting it in some clever way between the plates of its armor above its heart, killed itself before the traveler could prevent it. Such is their veneration for their lunar orb. Upon their moon's face is a curious pattern of rings and lines that is the holy symbol for their race. When graven into an amulet by our necromancers, this sign confers certain perceptions that are useful in dealings with the dead. However, the scattered few of these creatures who continue to inhabit our world can sense its presence when it is near to them, even when the amulet bearing this seal is hidden from their sight and they will seek out with tireless intention its possessor and slay him, then take the amulet away with them. Their voices upon their own world are silent, for the air is too thin for speech. They communicate by means of colored lights from their heads that flash on and off, constantly changing with all the hues of the rainbow and with the rapidity of lightning. On our world, they are said by the shamans of Ling to speak dot most eloquently in the language of Lung. It is rumored in dark places that a small number of the race of Yugath still inhabit the mountains of the east, where they live in deep caverns and cultivate their crop as they do in their homeland. There are spies left upon this sphere to report its changes to the leader of their race. The hardy native folk who dwell in tribes under the authority of shamans in those heights call them Migab, and sometimes hear their murmuring voices echoing from the mountains as they talk in the tongue of the mountain race, and sometimes see their footprints impressed upon the snow that forever covers the peaks, yet they are elusive and subtle beings, and are seldom seen, and if observed they swiftly slay those who watch them so that their activities cannot be described. It is spoken in Yevith in the language of lights that the minerals in ancient times gathered and carried away from our world will soon be exhausted, and then their armies must return to take what they need from our soil. Not the kingdoms of men, nor the arcane knowledge of the elder race, perhaps not even the old ones and the death spawn of great Cthulhu himself, should he awaken at that time, will have the power to stand against them. The fifth portal, leading to Atlantis. The gateway to Atlantis crosses not only space, but time, for the traveler is precipitated into the distant past when most of our race dwelled in caves and wore uncured skins, possessing only stones with which to hunt and lacking the skill of writing whereby they might record their works. Atlantis was the highest achievement of man, as the Greek philosophers attest, and though eons have passed since its fall, man has yet to regain its wisdom. Why the reptilian beings who dwell beneath Hiram chose to create a portal leading to the eve of its destruction is not evident from their murals, but it may be that they found amusement in observing the fall of the city as a kind of entertainment of infinite variety, for each journey results in a different human vessel, and hence a varied experience for the traveler. Of the geography of the city little need be written, for it was well recorded by the Greeks, let it only be stated that Atlantis was founded upon a group of small and rocky islands in the ocean that lies beyond the Pillars of Hercules, far from any other lands. It was arranged in a series of concentric rings made up of great curving causeways that overlapped the islands, with roads that radiated from its center like the spokes of a wheel. In the exact center of the city stood its parliament building, a magnificent edifice of white marble quarried from distant lands and carried to the isles in ships, for the people of Atlantis were sea traders who profited greatly by conveying goods between the distant human settlements of the world. There has never been so bold a race of mariners. No sea was too remote or too dangerous for their sturdy galleys, and no coast unknown to their cartographers. 
In appearance, the Atlanteans were fairer skinned than our desert peoples, and some possessed golden hair and blue eyes. Enjoying both grace of body and strength of limb, they were reputed to be the most beautiful of all men, but their hearts were evil, and their fair exteriors concealed a blackness within. They came by their great sciences not honestly, but in dealings with the children of the god Dagon, one of the lords of the old ones who lies in his house beneath the waves beyond the pillars of Hercules, waiting for the stars to realign and become wholesome to his kind. His children have been called the dwellers in the deep. They have power to travel both across the land and through the water, although it is said that they much prefer the waves above their heads, and cannot with comfort long endure dryness on their skins, which have a faint bluish cast and are pallid, like the bellies of frogs. Their heads are blunt and rise from their shoulders without the mediation of a neck, their fingers and toes are webbed for easier swimming. At their sides are gills like those of a fish. They were no clothing but delight in costly ornaments and jewelry, and no superior workers in precious metals and jewels are to be found anywhere in this world. Endless wealth is theirs, for they are aware of all the shipwrecks that have ever been and have easy access to the wrecks to despoil them of their treasures. Backslash T is a strange characteristic of the dwellers in the depths that they feel affinity for our race. Tales are told of friendships, and even loves, between the children of Dagon and the children of man, and by some unnatural art they are enabled to breed with human beings when they wish to create offspring from these abhorrent couplings, for it was never meant by nature that the deep ones and the surface dwellers should engender children, and such spawn is cursed to the tenth generation, for breed as often as they will thereafter with men, they can never expunge the traits of their alien. Blood the women of Atlantis bred freely with the males of the children of Dagon, in their degenerate lusts preferring these couplings to union with men of their own race, and many children of mixed blood were created. They came to rule Atlantis, although they never appeared unveiled under the light of the sun nor openly challenged the arrogance of the pure-blooded citizens of the city, who regarded the mixed spawn of the deep with revulsion and contempt, even as they became dependent upon their unnatural intelligence and their associations with the children of Dagon to increase the power and prosperity of the city. Those of mixed blood grew to hate the much more numerous citizens of pure blood, and their hate burned even more deeply in their hearts than the hatred of the slaves stolen from many lands by the Atlantean ships, for the Atlanteans scorned physical labor of any kind, and relied upon the services of slaves for their every common need, so that the population of slaves within the walls of the city was greater than the number of those native born. The city was powered by the fires within crystals gathered by the children of Dagon from deep rifts in the floor of the ocean. These same stones were used to build terrifying weapons that could burn ships and overthrow fortifications. In their conceit, the Atlanteans considered themselves invulnerable to invasion, both because of the weapons and by virtue of their remote location so far from the lands of the barbarian races. The half-breeds with the bluish blood of the deep ones flowing coldly through their veins were content to run the affairs of the city and wait and watch for their opportunity to overthrow the arrogant nobles. In secret they devised a plot with the foreign-born slaves and with the children of Dagon to overthrow Atlantis and slay all those of pure blood, for they reasoned that the nobles contributed nothing to the keeping of the island and therefore served no purpose. A sole traveler to Atlantis through the portal beneath Hiram emerges within the body of one of its inhabitants, but whether in the body of a slave, or a noble, or one of mixed blood is a matter of chance that cannot be controlled. The portal is so constructed that the visitor emerges in the mid-morning, and for several hours may observe the works of art and social pastimes of the city through the eyes of his host. In the afternoon the invasion of the dwellers in the deep begins, in unison with the uprising of the slaves, and the chaos that ensues makes observation difficult, for the vessel of the traveler is often swept away on the ebb and flow of warfare, or may even be slain outright in the first clash of arms. It is at once apparent to the traveler that the blue-blooded traitors who conceived the overthrow of the city miscalculated in their assessment of the decadence of the nobles, for though they have little skill in any other field of endeavor, the nobility excelled in warfare, which was the devotion of all their energies throughout their lifetimes. 
From the age of five years, they were trained daily in the use of the sword, the javelin, and the bow, and soon became wise in innumerable ways of killing. The half-breeds sought to keep the nobles away from the weapons vaults, where the energy crystals were stored, but they were swept aside in the first assault of the nobles so that when the forces of the Deep Ones arose from the sea, the noble warriors of Atlantis stood ready to repel them. The destruction wrought by the crystal-like cannons wielded on both sides of the conflict is beyond the power of the pen to convey. No such warfare has ever been waged in modern times, for the art of making weapons so powerful has been lost even to the Deep Ones themselves, who forgot in the ages since Atlantis sank the art by which the crystals are empowered. So great were the forces released that the very fabric of matter itself was made unstable, and the sea would no longer support the isles upon which the city was founded. A rift opened and the city sank, together with all its inhabitants of many races and those dwellers in the deep who were too slow to flee to safety in the turbulent waves. A traveler to this fair city is constrained by the nature of the portal always to watch, never to act, for the vessel into which his soul is precipitated cannot be influenced by his will. The reptilian race that made the soul gateways so contrived this portal to prevent a traveler from attempting to influence the outcome of the conflict. Were it possible to control the hosts, a man might go back to the same moment in time repeatedly and in this way amass an army with a single purpose, to change the history of the battle so that Atlantis was not destroyed. What the consequences would be for later ages is a matter to ponder, but the reptilian race took care to ensure that no such tampering with the river of time might be attempted. The Library of Atlantis is located to the east of the Central Ring Promenade, which surrounds the buildings of government. If you are fortunate, your soul vessel may proceed toward the center of the city, to which all roads that are straight lead, then turn into the morning sun to face a pillared structure with a shining roof of beaten copper, before which stands an immense statue of their god Dagon. Entrance is freely granted to all, for slaves are employed to carry books to their masters and to return them, and none of the librarians question their presence. The storehouse of wisdom is immense, gathered over centuries from all corners of the world, and translated by scribes, then inscribed onto plates that resemble gold, but are not gold, with the sharp point of a stylus, a form of writing that is almost as flowing and graceful as our own letters. The plates are bound together by rings to make books. The frustration to the seeker of wisdom cannot be described. It is surely greater than the torment of Tantalus, who stood deep in water that receded each time he sought to drink. Only the book chosen by the visitor to the library will be seen, and then only if that person stays to read a portion of it. It is unfortunate that the favorite texts of the Atlanteans were florid romances containing extended erotic descriptions and complex social conflicts that have little meaning for the traveler. Should you be fortunate enough to find a work of greater value open before your eyes, it is sure to be shut before you have had your fill of its viands, and return as often as you may you will never see it again, for you cannot inhabit the same body twice at the same moment in time. The Sixth Portal, Leading to Cadith There are places in this world precious to the seeker after arcane arts, yet unnamed in the cities of men, that may be reached afoot, or on horseback or by ship, though many are distant and difficult to find and even more difficult to attain. Other wondrous realms exist that may not be visited by common means, no matter the keenness of desire or the willfulness of striving. Some, such as the city of Atlantis, are in other times, either in years that have passed or years yet to come, others have presence in our own time, but not in this space in which we dwell, so that a man with unaltered mind might walk through them as through a shadow or a mist and have no awareness of their nature, unless at the nape of his neck there arose a prickling of unease. Cadeth in the cold wastes is such a place that is of our time, but of another space. It is fabled to lie north of the plateau of Lung, beyond the snowy mountains, this is no more than a fable, but it has a mustard seed of truth at its heart, for Cadeth is near the ruins of the ancient city of the Elder Ones, and the creeping of the land upon the ocean that supports all the ground of our world has carried both far to the south, whereas the ruins of the city of the Elder Ones are of stone, 
The great mountain known as Kadath is not material and cannot be seen clearly with normal sight. Many men have dreamed of it and have not known of what they dreamed and always their reports are different for each dreamer makes his own world in the endless lands of sleep and no two visions of Kadath seen in dreams are the same. The audacity of the reptilian race that built their city beneath the sands where stand the ruins of Iram was astonishing, for they dared to construct a sole portal to the mighty fortress that adorns the heights of Kadath, where out of unity with this material existence that we know as our world dwell in perpetual twilight the gods of this sphere. No king or sorcerer of men would have dared such an outrage. The crocodile beings cared nothing for the sanctity of human adoration, their curiosity knew no bounds of respect or prudence, and at the height of their wisdom they grew arrogant and indifferent to the wrath of the gods, who indeed had not the power to thwart them even though they were aware of the portal and resented it. Kadath rises beyond the barrier mountains in the southernmost land of this world. It is higher by far than any material peak of stone, but it is not wholly of this world and may only be seen by the unaided mortal gaze at certain times of the year when the heavens align and under moonlight, for know ye that the moon has power to reveal what the light of the sun hides. Atop Kadath was built by the gods a great fortress of vertical black battlements miles in extent from their bases to their towered crests. Within these protective walls and higher still in elevation is a palace of the richest metals and stones so that it seems a single shining jewel. At the heart of the palace is a vast throne room with walls of onyx and floors of multicolored polished stones, a circular vault so lofty that its very ceiling is lost in mists. Here the thrones of the chief amongst the gods, each shining with gold and silver, stand in a ring facing inward and in the center of the floor lies a great round mirror in which the gods look down upon the affairs of mankind as through a window that opens downward upon our world. A traveler entering the portal to Kadath emerges within this throne room, not in the body of a god, for even the reptilian race that constructed it was not capable of such an outrage, but in the flesh of one of the numerous servants of these earthly deities, who are ever present to tend to their slightest whims and are constantly moving to and fro, in and out from the vaulted chamber. Many bear the features of our race, which are like to the features of the gods themselves, though less subtle. The gods take comfort in having servants that resemble them to tend to their more personal desires. Other creatures less human perform the drudgery of the palace. The human-like servants are more numerous, and it is likely that the soul flyer will find himself within such flesh. They are easy to control with the will, and may be made to approach and regard any object of interest. A secret must here be revealed to the wise, who will not repeat it save by whispering it into the ear of a trusted disciple of many years, for it has caused the deaths of many men. It is believed by the heathens and the barbarian races, and also by certain hidden sects in our own lands, that these gods who dwell at Kadath in the frozen wastes were the makers of mankind. The truth is opposite, for it was the dreams and visions of men, empowered by their desires and driven by their wills, that caused the gods to coalesce from the very fabric of space itself in the dim beginnings of humanity. Man was created along with the other benign animals of this earth by the elder things for their amusement, and when man first began to dream, the gods were formed. This is the secret held by the Egyptian priests, who never forgot it even over the centuries their land suffered the subjugation of the Greeks, and after them the Romans. The priests teach that men have power over the gods through the art of magic, because humanity created them in dreams. Indeed, the dreams of our race sustain the gods still, and without those dreams they would fade to the nothingness from which they arose. A visitor to Kadath will observe that the gods vary in size, the smallest being no larger than their servants and the largest of gigantic proportion and towering above the rest. The thrones themselves are similarly various in their dimensions. Nor is the size of any god fixed, but changes over the passage of generations as many or fewer of our race remember and worship it. As the god increases or diminishes, so does its throne, for the throne is the seat of its power. It might be thought that the gods, 
in the midst of their beautiful palace, surrounded by every luxury and diversion they desire, live an existence free from care in which they enjoy endless pleasure. Not so, for a darkness hangs over them, making their voices hushed and their smiles pale. The gods do not rule Kadath unhindered, but endure an overseer who dwells in a small chamber located directly above the dome of the throne room. The chamber is of simple and rough stonework, unadorned by any hanging tapestry or carpet, having no furniture or illumination, lacking even windows or a door. Within its darkness resides the formless creature named Nyarlathotep, the faceless black god of distant space, he of a thousand forms, who is the messenger of the old ones. It is whispered by the gods that Nyarlathotep dreams in his tomb, even as does great Cthulhu in Malaya. But where the tomb of Nyarlathotep is located upon the earth or under the sea, they do not say. Within his dreams Nyarlathotep is present in Kadath, which he rules as a spider rules the shining strands of its web, sensitive to every movement and every presence. The gods have pledged their obedience to the purposes of the Old Ones, and in return the Old Ones aid the gods against their enemies and perform services for the gods that are beyond their power. No action is taken by any god of man without the knowledge and assent of Nyarlathotep, and those who defy his will, he destroys so completely that not even their memory is left to our race. It is for this reason that the gods never laugh. They gaze down upon us through their mirror and aid those who worship them with prayers and offerings, for a gift given demands a gift in return, yet always with the sufferance of dreaming Nyarlathotep whom no god has seen but who is ever present in the midst of their counsels. When he withholds his favor, they are powerless to act and must watch as their worshippers are destroyed by their enemies and their own vital force is diminished. The traveler feels relief in his heart when the time of his journey expires and his soul is drawn back through the portal of Kadath and into his own body of flesh, for flesh is warm to the touch and has a heart that beats, but the gods are only solemn shadows, fearful of the thing that watches from above. The seventh portal, leading to the Temple of Albion. The Isle of Albion lies beyond the pillars of Hercules in the northern part of the Western Ocean, yet so near to shore that it may be seen across the strait that separates it from the mainland. It is edged by high cliffs in color as white as the whitest bone bleached in the sun, and from this extraordinary feature it derives its name, for Albus signified the color white to the Romans, who conquered the land and subjected its barbarous inhabitants to their rule. Beyond the white cliffs extend flat grasslands. They were once the home of a cunning race wise in the secrets of the earth, who constructed many sacred monuments to their gods. The race departed long before the coming of the Romans, leaving only their curious constructions of earth and stone to continue upon the land, scarcely altered by the passage of myriads of years. The greatest of these ancient monuments is a temple of monoliths arranged in a circle so that they resemble rough hewn pillars that are squared rather than rounded. A massive series of lintel stones joins the ring and provided support for a roof of great beams that has fallen inward, prey to the corruption of the passing of years, so that only vestiges of it remain. Within the ring are even larger stones, as great in size as any erected by the arts of the Egyptians, though not so massive as the stones of Raya, which indeed it would not have been possible to move by the efforts of human beings. One of these great interior stones lies flat and served as an altar to the primary god of the ancients of the White Isle, Yogg-Sothoth. Indeed, it is said that the rounded shapes of all the temples of this race were an imitation of the shape of Yogg-Sothoth, who is seen as a conflux of spheres or circles of many colors. Upon the surface of the earth, and beneath it, are certain places where the barriers between worlds are thin, so that realities distant in space, or time, or in other ways that cannot be measured draw near in touch. The primordial ancestors of our race, who dwelt in harmony with the changing of the seasons and the movements of the stars, and who communicated with the old ones in their dreams, felt the power of these exceptional intersections of invisible lines of force and marked their locations with monuments, markings etched in the earth, mounds, temples, and other sacred forms. Of all these gateways to distant realms, 
The temple of monoliths on the Isle of Albion is the greatest, the mother to whom all others are dependent children. It has been written by our holy scribes that the al kabr in the great mosque at Mecca is the center of the world, but here is the confutation of this conceit, which is not blasphemous, for truth cannot blaspheme that the center of our world lies in Albion, and the circle that is a doorway from which many lines radiate across the land is the temple of monoliths upon the grassy plain. Read it and be wise, yet in your wisdom seal your lips to the ears of other men, for to speak it before fools is to court death at their hands. Many truths are known that are not to be spoken, and many truths have been lost to the silence of ages. The barbarians who dwell presently on Albion have forgotten the beginnings of the temple. The Romans believed the local fable that it was the work of the Druids, a priest caste that flourished in the forests of the Northlands and on the White Isle before the time of the prophet of the Christians, but even this lie has been forgotten by those whose mud and wattle huts are now erected near the temple, yet in their ignorance they cannot deny its power and a forbidden cult makes sacrifice of human souls at certain angles around the perimeter of the stone circle on appropriate days of the year when the sun aligns with the stars and the gates are unlocked. For these offerings to yogg -Sothoth, whose true name they do not speak, criminals condemned to death are used, and the form of sacrifice is to strike off their heads with swords as they kneel within their shallow graves, which they have dug beforehand with picks. By their blood, the lines of the earth that radiate from the temple, as the strands of a spider's web from its center, are quickened and their vital forces constrained in balance for the continuing fruitfulness of the soil. For if these lines become weak or entangled together, blights, upheavals, and quakings of the earth result not only on the isle of the temple but in distant lands in the far places of our world. The cult of the temple regards itself as the safe keepers of our world, and should its numbers fail, great catastrophes would surely follow. All its work is the harmonizing of the lines, and the use of the gateways to reach other worlds has been forgotten, save to a few men who gained it in the deep places from things more ancient than our race. A recent soul traveler to the round temple of Albion chanced to find himself inhabiting the body of the high priest of the mysteries of its cult at the moment of sacrifice in their most sacred ritual, which occurs at dawn on the shortest day of the year. Since he possessed no knowledge of the proper litany, he stood as one dazed with the broad sacrificial blade upraised in his doubled hands, staring down at the naked youth bound with his face to the sky upon the altar. The lesser priests began to murmur uneasily among themselves. Their leader came forward and demanded in the language of Albion that the high priest complete the correct recitation of verses. The traveler knew the language, but not the verses. Thinking to escape his predicament, he feigned illness and, swaying as though sick, caught himself upon the corner of the altar stone. The surprise of the surrounding throng drained the blood from their faces, so that in their white linen robes they resembled a host of specters in the pale light of winter dawn. After a moment of stillness, the lesser priests cried out, sprang upon their leader, thrust him in the place of the bewildered youth upon the altar, and drove the sacred blade through his heart. Only his great skill in necromancy allowed him to survive the death of his host and thus record this amusing tale as a warning to future users of the soul portals. It is to best advantage that the traveler to the temple of monoliths go there in his human vessel alone in the darkness when the waning moon has three nights remaining to complete her term and await within the temple the moment when the moon is centered above the solitary standing stone that lies beyond the doorless entrance to the temple. He must have his human vessel chew continually the leaves of the herb known as sinkfoil, so that its juice is ever on his tongue. When the moon has attained the standing stone, certain hieroglyphics will appear upon the surface of the recumbent stone. Mark their shapes well in the mind, and at the first opportunity inscribe them on parchment, for they have great utility in dealings with the old ones and those things that serve them. One who has read this book with care and understood its words may find these hieroglyphics elsewhere, if he has wit to seek them beneath the rays of the moon, for the sun is the moon's mate, and what is writ bold to his full face is whispered to her turned cheek. Gloss of Theodorus Philetus, 
The strange markings copied here I found painted beneath the black script of the Arabic text on a parchment leaf of the Book of El Hazard. They were not to be seen by day or by lamplight, but only under the rays of the quarter moon in her waning phase, which I happened upon by accident of a night when the breeze from my window extinguished the glow of my oil lamp. By what art they were made I can find no enlightenment. Led by this chance, I made investigation and discovered other images and writings beneath the pen words of the manuscript, some visible to the rays of the full moon, others at its waxing or waning phase, which I have copied onto the pages of this book for all to see where they appeared in the places of the original. What may be safely written of the old ones? In the sacred text titled Bereshit, signifying the beginning of things in the tongue of the Jews, we are taught that the Holy One created the world in six days, and on the seventh rested from his travail. Before he began there was nothing, and when he completed his work, all that we know was perfected, all stars of the heavens, all forms of plant and beast, all seas and mountains and plains, and that most noble pattern, Adam, the first man, more beautiful than the angels since his face mirrors the face of God. Our race was formed at the end of the sixth day, the final thing made by the Creator to be the Lord and ruler of every lesser creature and of the spaces of this world. So it is written, and men who are devout believers accept it as the sacred word of God, but a few among our race who are uncontent to receive teachings as an infant receives its milk, but must restlessly seek them out where they lie hidden, know that on the spaces between the days other creatures were made by other makers, and since they were made at night, they have remained unseen and veiled in shadow. Neither may it be presumed that our race is the most ancient or last of the masters who rule this world, or that the aggregation of living forms known to man walks unaccompanied. The old ones were, the old ones are, and the old ones shall be. They walk not on the places we know, but between them, tranquil and primal, by us unseen, for they are formless. Yogg-Sothoth remembers the gate, Yogg-Sothoth is the gate, Yogg-Sothoth is the key and protector of the gate. What was, and is, and shall be our one in Yogg-Sothoth? He remembers where once the old ones broke through the vault that separates our sphere from the outer darkness, and where they shall break through again. He remembers where they left the imprint of their feet in the mud of the earth, and those places where they still walk to and fro, and why no one can behold them as they pass. By their odor can men sometimes know their presence, but of their semblance no man can know, but only indirectly by peering into the lineaments and expressions of those they mingled with mankind, and of those there are many types varying in appearance from the mirror of man to the shadow outline of that invisible and formless presence that made them. They walk unseen and reeking in desert places where the words have been intoned and the rites held through at their proper times. The wind gibbers with their voices and the earth rumbles with their thoughts. They bend the trees and crush the cities, yet neither forest nor city beholds the hand that strikes. Cadeth in the cold waste knows them, yet what man may truly boast that he knows Cadeth? The ice wilderness that lies far to the south and the isles drown beneath the sea's bare stones upon which their seal is cut, but who among common men has seen the frozen city or the seal tower garlanded for ages with seaweed and encrusted by barnacles? Great Cthulhu is their kin, yet he can discern them only dimly. Aye, aye. Spubmigarath. As a foulness shall you know them. Their hand is at your throats, Yet you see them not, and their dwelling place is even one with your guarded threshold. Yogg-Sothoth is the key to the gate wherein the spheres meet. Mankind rules where they ruled once, they shall rule where man rules now. After summer is winter, and after winter summer. They wait, patient and potent, for here shall they rule again. At their return all men shall bow their heads and serve them as lords, those few who remember their ancient presence with invocations and offerings given at their places of power shall command the mass of our race who bleed as sheep and low as cattle when they are led to the slaughter, for we are as food to them and as beasts of burden that toil in the fields. The prayers of the prophets shall not prevail against them, neither crescent nor cross nor star can forestall their approach, when once again the heavens align and the gate is opened. Law Maralathotep 
they shall visit us in darkness, but by their fires the night will be made flashing with the brightness of polished brass set against the face of the sun. Seven are the lords of the old ones, six who are as brothers and sisters, and a seventh who is to them as the son of a father's brother, and who stands apart although he is one with them. The names of others of their race are whispered in the deep caverns, but the others have not the same family blood, and these seven are the leaders or heralds in our world. Among the seven are those better known and those obscure, for not all the old ones interest themselves equally in the affairs of this world. Their names are Azathoth, Dagon, Maralathotep, Yig, Shabmigarath, Yagsathoth, and the seventh who stands apart, Cthulhu. Within the room of seven soul portals, in the nameless subterranean city of the reptilian race, are cut and rocked the seven seals of the lords, each above one of the gates, though it is not always apparent what connection the lands beyond these portals bear the old ones. Murals in other chambers and passageways tell of their forms and natures, so that by a careful study of these images they may be known in part, and only in part, for no man has ever comprehended all their ways or their purposes upon the earth. The Magi who dwell in the Valley of the Tigris allotted to these lords of the Old Ones the spheres of the wandering bodies of the heavens, not because they dwell in the planetary spheres, nor yet because the planets have power over them, but for the reason that the rays of the planets are in a certain accord with the potencies of the lords. Under the heads of the planets, as under titles of authority, shall they be severally examined herein. Yig, corresponding with the sphere of Saturn. From the beginning man has feared the serpent, but why this lowly creature that crawls upon its belly and nests beneath the earth should be an object of dread and wonder has been forgotten, though the causes are echoed in our dreams and in the myths of our ancestors. In the sacred book concerning the creation it is the serpent who teaches wisdom to Eve, and for its reward it is written that humankind and serpentkind are forever after to become deadly enemies, and so it came to pass. The serpent has ever been regarded as the wisest of living things, and deathless, for it renews itself by the shedding of its skin. How shall it be that the wisest of beings is the most reviled and feared? Know that the wisdom of the serpent is the wisdom of Yig, most ancient of the lords of the old ones. In the dimness of time Yig made approach to the ancestors of man and spoke silently in their minds, offering to teach our race the secret of eternal life in return for loyalty and worship, but the prophets feared the knowledge of the serpent and counseled that the covenant with Yig be rejected by the people, lest they be tainted in their souls with the poison of the viper in the ASP. For this reason all snakes are killed at first sight, even though they be harmless and offer no inconvenience. Yet not all the people followed the prophets, some made secret pacts with the Lord of the Serpents, and they are known by their adoration of his favorite creature. The serpent is not native to our world, but was carried here from beyond the stars before the awakening of our race as a thing of amusement and diversion by Yig, and as a reminder of the world where he arose, for the shape of the serpent is the shape of this god, his true shape, for he goes sometimes in the form of a man with the head of a snake, but this is only the shape he puts on for his dealings with men. In his true shape he undulates upon his belly and has no limbs. Dembala he is called by the black-skinned barbarians dwelling on the coast of Africa, and by the Egyptians he is known as a pep. He is remembered in the myths of the Greeks as the cosmic serpent that encircles the world, who is without beginning or end, for he is deathless. Many are the places of his worship. He is strong in the temples of the eastern lands, where the basilisk is especially revered and protected as the monarch of serpents, for it consumes lesser snakes as prey and stands upright upon its tail to the height of a man, and its gaze has the power of causing entrancement in the minds of those who look into its eyes, there is no power of human will strong enough to resist its seduction. Only by the music of the flute can it be controlled, and when it hears this sound it begins to dance and loses its power to strike so long as the music plays. Learn herein a deep mystery, known to few, that the music of the flute is the song of Azathoth, the blind idiot god, he who is the center of creation, whose song made the myriad of worlds, the flute of Azathoth all created things obey, 
be they ever so unwilling to do him homage, for in their hearts they despise this lord for his mindlessness. Stronger still is Yig in the temples of the unknown lands that lie beyond the western ocean, where he is worshipped as a god in the form of a winged serpent. The wings express the flight of Yig, who has the power to bear himself through the airy zone of our world as though carry on the wings of a bird. These Jans are known to but a few tribes that dwell in the distant northland of Hyperborea where it is perpetual twilight, for these tribes are great seafarers and worshippers of Yig, their very ships are shaped with the heads of dragons, and their swords are patterned after the scales of serpents. The dragon that flies in its serpentine shape expresses yet another form of this old one. A wise man disregards the teaching of the prophets and will not slay a serpent, not even if struck and envenomed, for to kill serpents is to invite the displeasure of this god, who uses the serpent for his eyes in all parts of our world. Wherever a serpent crawls and watches, there watches Yig, even though it be the least of snakes scarce larger than a worm. All are his children, for all hold in their nature the essence of this god, who is great with their multitude but diminished when they are slain. It is whispered that were all serpents to be killed, so Yig would pass out of our world, but whether there is truth in this saying only the event will show, and that shall never be witnessed by men, for the serpent is eons more ancient than our race and will endure eons after our fall to dust. Those who worship Yig summon him to their rites by means of his seal coupled with the following invocation, which they chant in unison while swaying their bodies to the sounds of flutes. The constellation sacred to Yig is that known as Draco, and his sect believes that the god dwells there and gazes down upon the world. He is called into the body of a priestess who lies naked upon the sand, writhing her limbs and hissing through her lips, her thighs anointed with blood and her eyes roll back into her head so that only the whites may be seen. Approach, deathless one, heed the summons of the flu of Azathoth your creator, the song of which none of his blood may deny, to send slithering down the rays of the stars from the coils of the dragon. Great serpent old of years and wise in wisdom, at the beginning of time you gave the gift of knowledge to the race of man, through the embrace of a woman during the forbidden days of her cycle, enter again this female vessel whose thighs are streaked with blood and answer your teachings into her mind, that your faithful servants may profit from her instruction. Render sweet the fruits of her womb. Empower her with your mighty arts to defend us against our enemies, and against those who would defame your memory. Ye, Y-T-I-M-N-G Thursday I'll be Uga Eith Yig Flangelbathab. The Magi liken Yig to the sphere of Saturn, for the reason that Yig is the most ancient of the old ones, and Saturn the most ancient of the planets, the serpent is coldest of beasts, and this wandering body inhabits the most distant reaches of the heavens, where the warmth of the sun is least, Yig is wisest of the old ones, and Saturn is wise in secrets and mysteries, serpents hunt their prey in the main at night, and Saturn inhabits the darkened depths of space, serpents are slow and sleepy. When chilled, and Saturn is the slowest of the wandering bodies. They gave to Yig the number square of Saturn, as a sign and expression of his nature. It is a square of numbers having three rows and three columns, each with three cells that sum 15, and a total of nine cells that sum 45. From this square the seal of Yig is extracted, for the letters of the Hebrew script, most ancient among the writings still used by mankind, are also numbers, and the letters in the name of the god may be traced upon the square. It is believed by the Magi that this seal, made into a talisman and lead and worn close to the heart, offers protection against the biting of serpents and attracts the benevolence of Yig, or at the least averts possession by the god, for it is the custom of Yig to enter the bodies of his worshippers as a spirit, and his presence is known when they fall on their bellies and writhe on the ground in imitation of the way of all serpents, and hiss with their lips, but cease to speak in words of their own tongue, for it is singular with Yig alone among the lords of the old ones that he never speaks, but instructs his possessed worshippers with images in their minds. In this condition they forget the use of their hands, and if they must pick up a thing they do so with their mouths, for all the power of a serpent is in its jaws, wherefore the word Yige signifies in the tongue of the old ones big of mouth. 
The power of Yig to become present to human sight and to work his will in the world is greatest at two days of each cycle of the moon when the course of the moon and the course of the sun intersect. These conjunctions are known to the astrologers as the Kappa Draconis and Kaga Draconis, or in the common tongue as the head and tail of the dragon. These conjunctions are sacred to Yogg-Sothoth, the keeper of the gates between worlds. On these days of each month, the worshippers of Yig rejoice and celebrate his rites, but the enemies of the serpent god conceal themselves in dread and terror his approach, for his coming brings either exaltation or punishment, and no man has seen him who has not been moved either to happiness or sorrow. Yogg-Sothoth, corresponding with the sphere of Jupiter. The race of Yuggoth who came to our world in the distant beginning of time before the making of man, and who fought the Elder Ones and drove them deep into the south where lies frozen the land of perpetual ice, give greatest honor apart from their moon to Yogg-Sothoth, whose existence is in unending harmony with all dimension and all continuance. But the creatures of Yuggoth call him in their own tongue of flashing colored lights him who lies beyond, or the transcendent lord. The Megav remaining in our world in the highlands of the East continue to serve him and act as his agents and messengers. Only Yogg-Sothoth has the power to open the way between their distant homeland that is beyond the changeable star known as Thabra al-Dub al-Akbar, the back of the greater bear, and their colony on Yuggoth that is beneath the sphere of the fixed stars. For he guards the heavenly gates jealously even as he creates and destroys them from moment to moment with his dancing. Tullers Truly did the sage Ibn Shikabo write that the face of Yogg-Sothoth is the face of the heavens itself. He and the vastness of space are the same, and the turning, interlocked circles of the spheres are the orderly progression of his thoughts, some moving fast and others slowly, even as turn the bands of the astrolabe to mark the motions of the wandering stars. He is seen only by his face, body he has none, for his body is the universe, yet not the very matter of creation but the measurements of angles and distances between, for he is composed of no tangible thing and can only be perceived as a shimmering array of ever-changing colors such as may be seen on the shell of a beetle or the wing of a dragonfly beneath the sun. He is known by the cults of men that adore his gates as the all-in-one who is one in all. They worship him within stone circles composed of great monoliths, and the chief of these is on the grassy plains of Albion, though its builders have been forgotten, its function is unimpeded, for from it open outward gateways to all reaches of this cosmos and countless lesser gates. It is the great mother of doors, and Yogg-Sothoth holds the key. These gates he cannot open wantonly, but only when the stars align and the angles come right for passage. A gate is open when he appears, and his face of flashing colored spheres, all overlapping and turning one within another at varying rates, is the gate, and the key, and the way. Those who pass through become for a timeless Aeon Yogg-Sothoth, knowing all things that were, that are, and shall be, but having transited the gate they forget everything save only for a lingering sadness and sense of regret that cannot be set into words, and so profound and enduring is this sorrow that many are those who find life unbearable after opening the face of the transcendent hall. While there are men who have dared to seek glimpses beyond the threshold, and to accept him as a herald, they would have been more prudent to have shunned commerce with him, for as Ibn Shikabo relates, it is written in the Book of Thoth how fatal is the payment for but one glimpse of his face. Neither is it permitted that those who pass through the higher gates ever return, for in the empty spaces transcending our world are patterns of shadow that grasp and bind. The thing that stumbles by night, the wickedness that defies even the Elder Seal, the throng that gather watchfully at the secret portal possessed by each tomb and make themselves fat on what grows out of the corpse within, all these abominations are less than he who guards the gateways, he who will guide the rash traveler that speaks the words rightly beyond all the spheres and into the void of unnameable hungers. For he is called Tall Adamer, the first ancient one, which the scribe has rendered imperfectly in our tongue as the prolonged of life. When the road of the moon and the road of the sun cross in the heavens, then is Yogg-Sothoth exalted and empowered to open the spaces between the stars, and greater still is his power when the sun and moon copulate, and the gateways spawned are his children, for he is sun and moon united in lust. 
The sweat of the sun falls, but the dew of the moon rises to maintain his balance of turning circles. This is the invocation, cried out in the tongue of the old ones, that calls him at these pregnant times within the circles of stone, having met all requirements of worship and sacrifice. Nai, Ngaba, Bugshagik, Y Bab, Yagsathath, Yagsathath, Ai, Yab, Bugshagik, Ngaga, Ngai. The charm to open the gate is to be inscribed with the seal of the cap at Draconis and may be voiced following the preliminary summons on either day of the month, for both head and tail of the dragon are times when the heavens are in balance, so that on these days the way may be opened or closed, and the charm of opening is this. Yain Gab Yak Sothith H-E-L Gab F-A-I Thraik Wab the charm to be inscribed and cried out with the seal of Kata Draconis for the seal ing of the gate that was opened by Yogg-Sothoth is the same but turned against the course of the sun even as the first charm follows his golden chariot. The charm of closing is this. Ogbrad AIF Gebel EH Yogg-Sothoth Gabbing AIE Tro In this way are unlocked the gateways of the soul and also the flesh, but after another manner. Soul can carry flesh with it, either upward or downward, either into the light or into the shadow, yet flesh has no will to bear the soul where the soul refuses to travel, and if the gateways of flesh are open without the willing concord of the mind, the body becomes hollow and a vessel for demons, and the soul a wraith howling in the wind. In invocation of the first ancient one, or when summoned before him by his power, the supplicant demonstrates his fidelity to the god by falling to his knees and placing his palms over his eyes with the fingers up, then rhythmically bowing at the waist until his head touches the ground, as though in silent lamentation. This he does nine times, having a care to the number, for if the obeisance is given incorrectly or the number is more or less, the god will blast to glowing cinders the body of his careless worshipper. The searchers of the heavens who dwell in the valley of the Tigris have joined Yogg-Sothoth with the sphere of Jupiter, for the reason that mighty Jove is the father of lesser gods, who rules their comings and goings and holds the keys to the gates of Olympus, to journey all must seek his sufferance, and all in the tax that is levied at the entrance of the city from travelers seeking to pass either to or fro. They held the belief that the seal of this god formed upon the square of numbers sacred to the sphere of Jupiter, having four rows and four columns, each of which sums thirty-four and sixteen cells overall, the sum of which is one hundred and thirty-six, when inscribed on a square of tin would avert the wrath of Yogg-Sothoth and would afford good luck and protection to the traveler on his road, to which belief the wise may ascribe little value, for many of the stragglers after the caravans who were this square about. Their necks and their bones lie white on the sands where the carrion hawks have scattered them. Cthulhu, corresponding with the sphere of Mars. Great Cthulhu is ever a warrior god, and of all the old ones he is the most terrible, for it is his delight to slay and lay waste to everything that lies beneath his feet, and the very lust to conquer what was once free drives him onward across the heavens and through the spheres. It was he together with his star spawn that defeated the elder things, who had long possessed the sovereignty of this world before he descended on his grey and leathern wings through the upper gate opened by Yogg. Sothoth As hungry wolves on an unguarded flock they fell and crushed the great stones of the barrier walls of the elder cities into sand. Even the Shoggoths were driven as chaff in the wind before their fury, who can measure the strength of a Shoggoth, Yet it is whispered by ancient things that dwell in the depths that its strength was without avail against the might of this god. Into the sea the elder ones fled, little dreaming that through the changes of fortune and the passage of ages they would once again walk the frozen stones of their greatest city far to the south, and Cthulhu would lie trapped beneath the waves in the sea. Long eons the old ones reigned in our world after the vanquishing of the elder race, their palaces and cities secure under the protection of Cthulhu and his armies. No foe could defeat him, save only time itself, for the heavens revolve unceasing in their courses and care nothing for the will of men or gods. The stars became poisonous to the old ones in our world, 
and so they withdrew in bitter rage to bide their purpose until the sky was once more wholesome, yet Cthulhu would not depart from the lands he had conquered. He devised a work of potent magic that would keep him safe within the house he had made for himself on the mountain that overshadowed his island city of Raya. Within a tomb protected by great seals he lay as in death, yet he dreamed and in his dreams continued to rule the world, for his thoughts mastered the wills of all lesser creatures. How could he have foreseen the cataclysm of the lower earth that drew Raya beneath the waves? The waters of the deeps were the one barrier his great mind could not pierce, and it was for this reason that the Elder Ones had sought refuge beneath the waves so many ages before, to escape from his tyranny. The barrier that protected the Elder Ones while Cthulhu raged above has guarded humanity from his fury throughout the history of our race, for he has never ceased to hurl his commands forth from his mighty mind all the span of his turrets beneath the surface. The stars do not always remain poisonous, but for brief periods in their endless turnings they assume the angles of the same rays they shed down in the primordial dawn of the world. Then does Rai arise upwards so that the house of Cthulhu emerges into the air. The might of the god waxes strong, and he uses its power to send forth to men who are susceptible to his influence the command that they release the seals that bind his tomb, for it is his single weakness that he cannot release himself from sleep but must rely upon hands of flesh to shatter the seals. As though in bitter jest, the stars never remain right for more than a handful of days, and always in the past, before the men enslaved by the god can reach distant Waya, their fatal conflux of lights permits Raya to sink once more, severing the bond between the will of Cthulhu and the flesh of those he has enthralled, leaving them to wail in confusion and despair upon the bosom of the vacant sea. On the walls of lost cities and in the carvings of madmen who have glimpsed him in their dreams is the form of the god delineated. His height is as great as a mountain and he walks onto long feet that resemble those of a hawk, so that the very stones of the earth are shattered by each step, yet from his back extend vast wings that have no feathers but are made of skin as are the wings of a bat, and with his wings he flies between the stars. His body has the shape of a man in that he has two arms and two legs, but his head cannot be described without horror for it is akin to the formless mass of a deep dweller, having many ropes or soft branches that hang and writhe in place of a face, and his crown throbs and moves with watery softness for he has no skull. His eyes are small and three in number on each side of his head. The color of his skin is green mingled with gray on his limbs and trunk, but paler gray on his wings, and these he is accustomed to keep folded so that they hang down to the ground behind his heels and tower above his pulsating crown. Such is the unnatural body of this god, which has no kinship with the dust of our world. Indeed, it is not flesh as we know flesh, but as crystal or glass, and soft so that during his dreaming death it often breaks apart, but when it breaks it at once reforms itself, held in its pattern by the will of the Great One. This truth the elder race, who are indeed of solid albeit strange flesh, learn to their dismay, as their murals in the city of heights on their own world attest, for no sooner did they shatter the body of Cthulhu with their arts of war than it reconstituted itself and in moments was whole. He is as their own shockets, about which men whisper but which no man has seen, able to take the shape of his desire and to hold it. His spawn are like himself but smaller in their dimensions, what they lack of their master in size, they compensate with their numbers, for they fly into battle as the locust swarm descends upon the ripening field of grain, so thick that they obscure the sun with their wings. At times past the Megob have followed his commands and battled in his wars, for they dread the influence of Cthulhu upon the whim of their god of passage, Yogg-Sothoth, and risk any danger rather than court his displeasure. All this was in the ancient times, and in the age of man Cthulhu lies dreaming in Waya, his spawn has vanished, and the Megob are returned to Yuggoth, all but a few that watch and wait. The tale is whispered that at some future time the stars will move in their courses and align as they have in the past, but at last their pattern will endure and the world will become wholesome for the old ones. Cthulhu will rise and conquer, as is his right, for what force of gods or men can stand against his fury? Until that day, 
may it soon be witnessed, those wise in necromancy who adore him with a seal of the god burned upon their skin and chant a litany in his remembrance in the tongue of the old ones that dreaming Cthulhu teaches his prophets in their sleep. P.H. Angloui M.G.L.W. Nath Thalburaya Wab Nagel Phtan La The prayer has this meaning in our tongue, at this house in Malayab, dead Thalbu waits dreaming, it is so, in the far places of the world, from the plateau of Lane to the western Isle of Albion to the banks of the Nile and the frozen wastes of Hyperborea, his chosen chant these words, and they are the sign by which they know each other, and the bond that unites them even when they are of different races. The poet may sing a different song, for they chant what has been and what remains, but the poet intimates in verse what shall come to pass. That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange Ian's death may die. Of all the lords of the old ones, Cthulhu stands alone and apart, for his is not the same blood with the others, though his blood mingles with theirs. They use him as a sword and think to distance themselves from his presence when the battle has been won, but he keeps his own counsel well guarded, and none can say what he intends for his kin. When all had fled the poison from the stars, he remained in his house at Raya and dreamed his deep purposes in solitude. The ocean alone contains him, for the stars cannot shackle his mind. It was because Cthulhu is the greatest of warriors that the Magi who are descended from the royal line of Babylon link him with the sphere of Mars, god of war, and none are wiser in the lore of the heavens than the priests of the Tigris. As Mars is the conqueror of all who oppose his will, so too is the dreaming god, as fire, the element loving to Mars, hates the water, so does Cthulhu hate the weight of the ocean above his head that frustrates his purpose. The Magi give to him the number square of Mars, having five rows and five columns, each with a sum of sixty-five, and the sum of this square as a whole is three hundred and twenty-five. They teach that the seal of his name traced upon the square and incised into a plate of iron has power to give victory in battle and protects the warrior from injury by sword or arrow, and that its sight is pleasant to the things that dwell in darkness and are loyal to Cthulhu, who spare the lives of those who bear it. But this last is a lie. As a thought, corresponding with the sphere of soul, there is a cause why the flute plays so prominent a role in the cults that worship the old ones in the dark places and hidden caves, away from the ears of common men. At the seething and fiery center of all, Azathoth sits upon his ebon throne within his halls of darkness that no man has seen and survived the vision. He is both blind and bereft of mind, but unceasingly he pipes upon his reed flute and the purling notes that rise and fall in measured patterns are the foundation of all the worlds. These notes are more than music, they are numbers. Azathoth ever calculates and sound the structure of space and time. Were his flute to suddenly fall silent, all the spheres would shatter into one another and the myriads of worlds would be unmade and as they were before the creation. There is a mystery known to few, that his flute is cracked and can give no pure sound. It is explained by sages that when he blew the first great note that began the outpouring of worlds, the force of the sound was so vast that no instrument could endure it, not even the flute that made it, but this is the reasoning of children, and the truth is elsewhere, for the crack in the flute is a way of expressing the imperfection inherent in all created things. All that is made is imperfect, for perfection can have no form or texture in the mind, as a thought himself is imperfect, being blind and blubbering as he pipes. Yet how can the Creator who was never made be himself imperfect? Consider this riddle and be wise. Only the breath that bears the sound ever outward in winding circles, unseen and formless, is perfect, for the sound is but a pattern pressed upon the breath, but the breath pervades all, if it did not, how would the sound be carried to the farthest reaches of space? It is not the breath we know, but the subtle essence of breath that can neither be seen nor felt, and is forever unknowable. The flu of Azathoth both makes and unmakes the worlds in ceaseless combinations that are like dancers spinning on the woven carpet of time. There can be no creation without destruction, and no destruction without creation, to unmake a thing is to make something else, 
and each time a thing is made, something is destroyed. The idiot god on his black throne does not choose what shall rise into being or what should pass away, but only maintains a balance and constant order in the number and pitch of his notes. These piping sounds are numbers, for they interact in ratio and proportion, all things are made of numbers, men are formed in their flesh by the arithmetic of Azathoth, who gathers his sums and brings forth shapes. No created being has seen Azathoth save only Nyarlathotep, who is called the chaos that creeps by writers who fear even to voice his name. And Azathoth is order, and Nyarlathotep is disorder, they are half-brothers and can never be separated, for even when far apart in space, Azathoth forever creates the patterns and Nyarlathotep forever disperses them. It was the blind idiot god who piped forth the universe, but it is whispered that it shall be the crawling chaos who on the last day of time shall snatch the flute from his blubbering lips and break it, ending all forevermore. Nyarlathotep looks upon his half-brother with contempt, yet knows full well that he is as dependent on the song of the flute as all other things, this enrages him so that he waits in eagerness for the last day. Concerning the face of Azathoth no pen has written, unless the writer lied, for no living creature can look upon it and endure its terrible heat and black radiance that is like the reverberating unseen rays of heated iron that strike and prickle the skin or crisp and sizzle it when too near. Only Nyarlathotep, who has no face of his own, has gazed into the countenance of the idiot god, and even he is dazzled by its fires and must turn away after an instant. Azathoth receives no supplicants in his black halls of uncouth angles and strange doors, nor does he ever hear prayers or answer them. Endlessly he pipes, and endlessly he devours his own substance, for his hunger is insatiable. Nothing is taken into his body from beyond, and nothing is expelled, for he consumes his own waste after the custom of idiots. Music alone issues outward from him, yet it has no substance or form, its semblance of form arises from the ever-present breath that pervades creation and bears it along, in itself the music is only number upon number, and so cannot be truly said to proceed from Azathoth, for how can a number possess motion through space? Despite the indifference of their god, members of the cult of Azathoth emulate his music and dance accompaniment, spinning and revolving on the wind they create with their own turning motions, pipes pressed to their lips and their eyes rolled heavenward. The dance is their ecstasy, the music itself their prayer. In this way they seek unity with the center of all things. They were as a pledge of their faith the seal of the idiot god over their hearts. Men ask in the marketplace in idle talk why the world was created, there is no answer, for the world was made without thought by an idiot to whom good and evil are the same. He hungers and feeds yet is never satiated, he pipes and hears but does not see. Of sorrow he knows nothing, neither has he felt happiness. He pipes with patience, and the music of his flute rolls outward in trilling waves that rise and fall upon the breath of the cosmos, and the notes fulfill their patterns and move inexorably toward the last day, when the fury of his half-brother shall be expressed and there will come silence. The wise men of the Tigris, learned in the ways of the stars, placed Azathoth in the sphere of soul, because both are at the center of things, the god at the center of creation and the sun at the center of the wandering bodies of the heavens. As the sun is hot and bright, so is the palace of Azathoth located in a place of great heat, and his face is blinding in its radiance that darkly shimmers. They gave to him the number square of the sun, having six rows and six columns, each making the sum of 111, and the sum of all is 666. This is the number of the beast of the Christians, and wisely was it chosen, for the beast shall usher in the last of days. The Magi make the seal of the god that is formed on this square into a charm upon a plate of gold and were it to attract money and substance, and to ensure health of the body, on the reasoning that all things come into being from the music of Azathoth, therefore his square must bring forth substantial virtues such as vitality of the flesh and the increase of wealth. Their reasoning is flawed, for as the god creates, so he destroys. Shabmigrath, corresponding with the sphere of Venus. 
of the fecundity of the earth there is no end. Her womb breeds monsters unglimpsed by those who dwell under the sun, and her twisting entrails crawl with things white and blind. These are the children of Shubnigarath, who is called the goat with one thousand young by those who dare not speak her name. She is of the gender of a woman, for what except the womb brings forth fleshy life upon the ground, or beneath it? Those who worship her with images most often depict her with the head of a goat. This is not her true visage, which is bestial, but unlike any beast known to men, yet it may be that the image of the goat was chosen as appropriate due to the readiness of this animal, which is proverbial. Her statues are black and made of stone, and are often of human size, though some are smaller for the convenience of carrying in those lands where her worship is severely punished. They show the goddess standing upright, for horns bristling from her hairy head, her mouth snarling with savage teeth like those of a wolf. Her arms and hands are those of a woman, but her legs and feet those of a goat. She is ever naked, her torso covered with innumerable round breasts to suckle her countless progeny, but that which is most shocking to those who strive to suppress her cult is the gaping and exposed state of her genitals. By this her worshippers express that Shubnigarath is the womb of the night from which all creatures of nightmare issue. In the ancient time, great Cthulhu lay with her and bred upon her the armies that overthrew the elder things, for the manner of her bringing forth is not one after the way of women, nor even a score after the way of mice, but myriads of myriads of children issue from her womb, which never closes. It has been ages since last she lay with her cousin, and most of his children are dead or have sought their dwellings deep beneath the sea and under the surface of the ground, for they hate the light of the sun and, being of the same substance as the old ones, cannot easily endure the noxious rays of the stars that presently keep Cthulhu imprisoned at Raya. When the stars are right, and darkness covers the earth, they will issue forth from their deep pits and lakes, and from the ocean, and fulfill the will of the old ones as they did in the beginning of things. Her rites are wild ecstasies of debauch during which brother lies with sister, mother with son, father with daughter, and infants conceived in this unlawful way are sacrificed to the prolific goat, and their blood consumed in wine to produce intoxication and visions, so also are the bodies boiled in great pots, and their flesh consumed by the revelers, who recognize no restraint of law and practice any outrage against religion. They are accustomed to meet in caverns during the night hours, both for greater security against detection and also because the deep places are the wombs of the world, sacred to Shubnigarath. With red and blue and yellow pigments they paint their faces and bodies, for they worship naked after the way of the goddess. Upon their backs they paint her seal, the men dance with their virile members inflamed and erect, and the women dance obscenely, opening and closing their bent knees to expose their genitals, and shaking their heads and their breasts while screaming invocation of the goddess to the beat of drums and the drone of flutes. Around blazing fires they dance, the flames rising. Higher than their elevated hands, and the men gash their arms with blades and spat tear the blood on the thighs of the women to make them more fertile. The women scream these words in the tongue of the old ones, Aye, aye. Shubnigarath. La. La. Their voices that echo in the caverns resemble the yelping of dogs, for there is nothing human in the sound. When the worshippers begin to couple, it is the women who mow on top of the men, in honor of the supremacy of the goddess as the womb of creation. The theological books of the Hebrews make veiled allusion to this practice in their fables concerning Lilith, who was the wife of Adam before Eve, and who had union with him on top rather than beneath, and the Babylonians had similar stories of a demoness of lust that bore strange children from the seed she stole away from sleeping men in the dark of night. In truth, Lilith is no other than Shubnigarath, even though the scribes of the Hebrews dared not write her name. She visits the men who seek union with her in their dreams, but only if their lust is great. When she comes to the bed, she presses upon the chest of her lover and takes her pleasure on top of his sleeping body, and from his ecstasy she gives birth to monsters of a lesser kind, those that inhabit the desert places of the world and lie in wait to murder travelers beneath the moon. 
From the seed of the old ones her womb gives rise to great abominations, but from the seed of men it yields lesser evils. In dreams she cloaks her form so that men do not withdraw from her, but when she visits her worshippers she comes as she truly appears, and they welcome gladly her bestial kisses, for she makes their virility unending. The worship of Shubmigarath is greatest in the lands of Lebanon and around the salt inland sea, but she is also adored with orgy and sacrifice along the upper tributaries of the Nile, on the western shore of the Red Sea, and between the rivers Tigris and Euphrates. Yet these are only the chief centers of her cult, for her worship spans this world and lands both known and uncharted, carried far and wide by her roving cult as it moves from place to place in its caravans. It has been the cause of much misery and countless mysterious deaths, since her worshippers must have human flesh for their sacrifices during her highest rites, and where infants cannot be procured they use the flesh of travelers, for the disappearance of a traveler causes less inquiry than the vanishing of a local dweller. The Magi gave to Shubmigarath the sphere of Venus as her natural harmony, because Venus is a goddess noted for her concupiscence, who brings fertility to beasts and crops. However, the life-giving power of Venus is wholesome, whereas that of the prolific goat is verminous and foul. As a charm to ward her off during sleep, they engrave upon a plate of copper the seal of the goddess formed on the number square of Venus, which has seven rows and seven columns, each of which sums 175, and the total of all the numbers of the square is 1,225. Some scholars profess the opposite belief, that the seal of the prolific goat attracts the goddess to the bed, and both opinions are true, depending on how the seal is employed, for if it is laid with the engraving downward against the chest, it attracts, but with the engraving upward to the sky, it repels. A young man of Yemen who wished to punish a rival in the love for a woman bribed a servant of the rival to bury the seal of this goddess beneath his master's sleeping place with the engraving down. J. In the span of a single cycle of the moon, the rival was so troubled by nightly visits of Shubmigarath in his dreams that his flesh wasted away and he went mad. The woman gave her love to the remaining suitor, who enjoyed it for a term until the revolving wheel of fortune stole her from his embrace.